Good afternoon. Very happy to see that uh, rumors about the death of the interest in NATO have been greatly exaggerated. We are delighted. We are Ambassador Hutchison, uh, Ambassador Lucas. The trust of Servitus is not yet here. Your Excellencies, Honorable Members of the European Parliament, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Daniel Schwamental. I'm the Director of the American Jewish Committee's EU office here in Brussels, the AJC Transatlantic Institute. And it's my great honor to welcome you to this exciting event. First of all, I would like to thank our great partner, the Friedrich Norman Stiftung, and its director, Thomas Ilke, for this wonderful cooperation. It is rather fitting that we are discussing the future of NATO so close to the remembrance of the past without the alliance. As we just commemorated the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, it is not difficult to imagine how different events would have unfolded had there been a transatlantic alliance of democracies already a few years earlier. For almost 71 years now, NATO has proven to be the most successful alliance pact in the world in world history. We did not only win the Cold War, NATO was also crucial in ensuring that it never got really hot. NATO, though, may be to some extent the victim of its own tremendous success. While the cost of NATO, financial and otherwise, is tangible, the alliance's benefits are obscured in the unwritten records of an alternate history. The wars and misery, NATO's effective deterrence, has and continues to prevent can never be demonstrated. And so the unusually long period of peace and stability NATO has helped to provide on this blood-soaked continent has lulled some into a false sense of security or to be more precise, to have led some to believe that there are no real threats out there anymore. But there is no end of history. The Alliance and its members states face perhaps the most complex set of threats and challenges in their history, emanating from all strategic directions state and non-state actors challenge the rule-based international order, be it state actors as Russia, China, or Iran, or terrorism, state-funded, and otherwise. We face cyber, missile, and hybrid threats. To counter these challenges, we need more, not less, NATO, and closer cooperation also with our democratic partners in the neighborhood, such as Israel. And so I'm looking forward to this interesting discussion. And I have the great pleasure to give the stage to uh, Thomas Ilka, the Regional Director of <coughs> European Dialogue at the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks a lot, Daniel, for the warm welcome. Dear Excellencies, dear Member of, of Parliament, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, we the Friedrich Naumann Foundation look up to NATO. While she turned 70, we only celebrated our 60th birthday lately. We may be a little younger, but we share NATO's values and NATO's international approach. The Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom operates in 60 countries on five continents, promoting human rights, free trade, international cooperation, and most important, Freedom. We are pleased and proud to co-host today's event, and that is for three reasons. Firstly, we are happy, Daniel, to team up again with our, one of our best and uh, long-standing partners in town, the American Jewish Committee. We are strongly connected by our interest in security politics and by our commitment to transatlantic partnership. I would like very much to thank you, Daniel, Michael and your whole team for the excellent cooperation. Secondly, today's event reflects our own renewed ambition as liberals to inspire and shape public debate on the future of European security. <coughs> At the heart of our defense programs in Brussels and beyond is our security expert hub, conducted and represented by my colleague, Sebastian Fart. Our activities aim at promoting European defense integration by facilitating dialogue and formulating policy proposals. We strongly believe 
that the successful future of the transatlantic partnership will depend on a deeper defense integration among Europeans. And I'm deliberately saying Europeans and not only EU members here. And thirdly, I would like to stress that we are not only a German or a European, but also a transatlantic organization. For decades, we have been closely cooperating with our sister office in Washington, D.C. on various programs striving to preserve and foster transatlantic partnership. For the sake of friendship, yes, but also because of the values and the interests we share across the Atlantic. It is against this background that the future of NATO is dear to our hearts and that we are co-hosting today's debate. <coughs> Let me conclude by thanking our friend Petras, who has arrived perfectly on time, for bringing a liberal European angle into today's debate, our moderator Terry for running the show, and Ambassador Sachs and Lucas for accepting to sit in the hot seat today. So now, Petras, it's your job to give us the liberal angle. The floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Friends and colleagues, I hope uh, to give not just a liberal but common sense based uh, <laughs> angle without miss it. Uh, the Brits uh, going away. We just had a voting session, uh, the last voting session, where our British colleagues uh, took part. And I can tell you the emotion which prevailed uh, over two days, last two days, something special. Usually you are very happy during uh, weddings, right? Like new members joining the European Union. But when uh, funeral comes, people sometimes are more thoughtful. And um, I didn't see in last uh, legislature from 14 to 19 anything similar what happened yesterday <laughs> and today. And I believe uh, that our emotional link, our dedication to those common sense uh, based uh, British colleagues, uh, liberal Democrats, very much of them, will prevail and we will have uh, outstanding cooperation and we will look forward, not backwards, in this regard. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity to address you shortly on uh, this that most important uh, topic. I was long involved in uh, NATO, EU, and uh, issues around. I was a NATO PA, I was vice president of this organization. Um, in the national parliament, I am a long standing uh, delegate for the NATO PA delegation as well. And now I'm uh, in a SESE Security and Defense Subcommittee of the European Parliament. And, uh, <clears throat> the EU Europe uh, coordinator on all those issues. And it will be no surprise for you um, to start uh, <coughs> speaking about NATO as an anchor organization for defending Western democratic and free democracies alliance. It was the first organization, I mean, established and to defend values and freedoms we still believe in and we try to expand this community of like minded. <coughs> Importance has increased because of recent decades' tendency, less democratic, uh, one of three countries, look at the democracy index uh, uh, findings every, every year, and what we see, a steadily decrease of uh, free countries, democratic countries. Big economic and military powers, China and Russia, openly, openly, and by doing, not just speaking, uh, questioning Western uh, ideals and uh, uh, globalization of, uh, of that. And I think we see just the beginning uh, of that. NATO is, um, is very different from 1990 or even before. Um, by size, membership structure, new types of threats, cyber, hybrid, original, Look at Iran's uh, influence uh, region wise. <laughs> so it's really something different what we had uh, decades before. Emergence of uh, strategic linkage between uh, trade and security, if more to come, is increasingly an increasingly globalized uh, 
world economy, again, I think we have to observe and act accordingly. Again, the list of so-called uh, more or less traditional threats uh, which uh, NATO and we openly disclose, Russia, jihadists, now climate change, is that, and, uh, adding to uh, those mentioned before. Again, space become a, a new game theater in defense matters more and more from ground to space, and this then is a And I can't uh, avoid mentioning uh, propaganda and disinformation. Through social media, it benefits uh, and it penetrates uh, everybody and so many societies in different ways. Um, and there is no sometimes kind of borderline between real and fake. Um, and the social uh, media interference, uh, it's uh, further expanded. NATO is a transatlantic alliance of like-minded partners and must remain as such. We have to admit uh, difference of opinions. Each and every family sometimes has it. Between the US and the European allies, at least some of them. And at the same time, we have uh, positively assess and acknowledge the European Defense Strategic Autonomy Initiative <coughs> coming from 2016, formally calling to decrease dependence on the US and uh, achieve better level of readiness. <coughs> European NATO allies are looking uh, are losing their relevance to transatlantic <coughs> partners and a deep partner in particular. The long time under investment policy and large fragmentation in Europe's defense sector as a result of very inefficient uh, proliferation of weapons systems on European sides of, uh, of NATO allies. Just to remind you, the Europeans field 178 major weapons systems, while the equivalent US figure is 30. <coughs> Europe has set 17 types of uh, main battle tanks compared to only one in the US. And 20 different types of combat uh, uh, aircraft, where the US has six. Maybe we are too rich and too innovative in this regard. But does it bring efficiency and uh, cohesion in sort of their ability? Lack of European uh, cooperation is in defense sector <coughs> cost between 25 to 100 billion euros. That's the assessment comes from uh, the European Commission. How the NATO future might look like, uh, taking uh, even a personal uh, angle into this. As you know, NATO is in preparations for 2021 summit, where some new strategic concepts uh, is expected to be uh, uh, outlined. We have to admit that uh, NATO being uh, flexible, thoughtful, and already been in kind of soul search exercise for some time. I recall times in uh, 2010 and um, even before when NATO was looking I mean, to become even a kind of humanitarian assistance and development assistance uh, provider because there was no job probably around for the time, you know, from smart defense to bringing and sharing. So we go, and we will go to something else. What I would advise, and I would like to see from NATO, to do better, <coughs> and for European parts of NATO, to do more. If that is uh, a kind of uh, path uh, leading to future, I will be, um, quite uh, content with the <coughs> developments. Secondly, NATO and EU undergoes a very big shift. We moved from ignorance, located uh, um, in the same city, <coughs> to cooperation. And EU 
strategic uh, autonomy concept must be seen as a positive impulse for increased greater EU's responsibility over its security. But Europe should uh, make uh, uh, everything possible, uh, po uh, possible to keep U.S. interest in Europe uh, better anchored. We have to admit that uh, in many, many operations we are involved even now, taking Sahel, taking other regions, we can't succeed without U.S. tangible participation. Thirdly, although we observe a gradual and long-term uh, U.S. disengagement from Europe, and some of them call it as a kind of um, strategic uh, uh, danger, from Europe and Middle East, I have to mention, with more focus on, and resources on Asia. But at the same time, if we look precisely <coughs> to things on the ground, and I, I want to bring to your attention uh, incoming military games, Defense 2020, but we're going to see the biggest ever U.S. operation in, uh, uh, and uh, participation in Europe. I'm more positively minded uh, looking at this. Things might look different on paper, but on the ground they're still very serious. And this operation is, is seriously no. <coughs> Fourthly, let's admit that NATO's alliance is working well and, um, and on time. Politicians are more divided than those who make real decisions. We heard from uh, NATO, uh, London NATO summit, there have been a very solid uh, common opinion behind the closed doors. Although outside sometimes we saw some political theater. Um, we can hardly prevent public uh, exchanges of highest NATO member states leaders, like Mr. Trump using a word describing NATO obsolete, Mr. Macron, brain dead. And those are coming from two nuclear power powers leadership. So, probably we have to get used to the new public communication style. Um, and we will get something more probably in, in, in years to come, but uh, let's be serious and focused on the real stuff. Fifthly, NATO leaders and politicians, and uh, this is my individual responsibility as well, we should look at new generation, both parts of the Atlantic uh, uh, Alliance, a new generation to win their minds and and hands, hearts, excuse me, to keep defense spendings adequate and uh, as high as it seems. <coughs> Public approval is our green light for decisions that we have to make, but it's not automatic. We have to prove it. Two percent is so much. I mean, for some countries, but. Uh, Maybe it's uh, so little, I mean, once you assess the present situation. And sixthly, as we just had a Brexit vote, uh, and the new partnership is unavoidable between EU and Britain, so EU and Britain should uh, conclude an uh, overreaching uh, uh, mutual security and defense uh, partnership that sets a framework uh, for Indeed, separate arrangements required uh, in areas covered uh, by different EU policy instruments and procedures. <coughs> and looking forward very, very much to this partnership, although I was not very optimistically minded after giving a mandate for negotiations from Security and Defense Committee. To my mind, it was too plain, too simplistic, and too automatic. But, uh, who knows? We have good negotiators uh, um, to come. I believe we can change this since, ladies and gentlemen, Europe is facing not just a transatlantic challenge. Now we're facing trans-channel challenge as well. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Petrus. Uh, thank you also to Thomas and Daniel. I'm Terry Schultz. I am one of the biggest NATO nerds in town, so it's well, there's some competition in this audience. Uh -huh. um, and I'm very excited and honored to be able to moderate this discussion today. I'm hoping it will be a debate because that's more exciting for journalists, but I'm not so sure. Um, <laughs> um, I would I would like to, to call up our um, discussion participants, Ambassador Lucas and Ambassador Hutchinson, uh, whom I'm very privileged to get to ask questions to uh, quite often. And so today I really see my role um, as being a moderator, letting the people who made the effort to come here participate in discussion with these two experts. And also we are very lucky to be live streaming this event, and so it's going to be exciting to hear from people out, out there who are watching us. And this is the first time that I am using this um, tool that we're going to use called Slido.com to this extent. But let me explain what I understand. Uh, about how it's going to work. So now, for once, I mean, most moderators don't like to see people looking at their phones during debates, but now I would like you to take out your phones if you'd like to participate and go to slido.com. And there there will be a hashtag. And, and you put in NATO 8. The 8 is to signify that we are heading into NATO's eighth decade of engagement. And here, uh, there, there will be a poll activated momentarily. And we would like all of you in this room and out watching us to let us know what you think the biggest threat facing NATO is today. And so you see here, we have choices of Russia, China, terrorism, internal divisions, and that would include the ones that Petrus mentioned. Uh, is NATO obsolete? Is it brain dead? Um, there are numerous other disputes. Should Turkey be kicked out, kept in, be dumped from the F-35 program? all of those things. Um, the next one, new weapons technology, and although that may make people think about, about missiles, um, as somebody who tries to fight disinformation, misinformation, and ignorance on my beat every day, I also consider um, social media divisions being purposely uh, riven by social media, um, by trolls, um, to be considered as new weapons technology. And then, of course, Russia and all of its various forms of uh, attempts to bring down the alliance. Um, other, I am, I told our, our um, host that I'm looking for new ideas. I would like to write about some other threat to NATO than the ones we already know. So I'll give you um, just a moment there to, uh, to vote. And then Ambassador Lucas and Ambassador Hutchison will, um, wow, will, um, the first question I'm going to ask them is to address whether these threats are reflected inside the alliance, if this is what they see every day on their jobs, um, or if it's something else. We only have 42 votes. Come on, that's not everybody. Yeah, Terry. Terry. Terry? Yes. Some people are asking the code for the Wi Fi. Oh, I don't know. Is there one out the board for the Wi Fi? What is the code? Sebastian, do you know the code for the Wi Fi in this building? Devaranda, together, small. D E W A R A N D E, small. Okay. Thank you. Good point. Okay. I'm going to take my seat. Okay. So we're still getting the votes in. Um, but it looks like uh, we have a clear winner here anyway. Um, I'm going to let Ambassador Hutchison start. Um, um, and uh, we have purposely not uh, opted to have opening statements so that we can have more time for this, um, these discussions here. And actually, I'm sorry, I need my phone to keep track of time here. Sorry about that. Um, all right, Ambassador Hutchison. On the hot seat with internal divisions because, yeah, we know um, where a lot of people's concerns come from. It's from your and my home country, the United States. Yes, I don't know if they can see what we're seeing. Yeah, they have screens up there, so they can see the voting up there, too. Yeah, sorry, we're all getting used to this technology, but it's really cool. Yeah, it is cool. And uh, it's also uh, my definite opinion that the majority is right. Um, the only thing that will defeat us and the democracies and uh, people who believe in the rule of law and human rights uh, in the world are internal divisions. And um, I think that we are seeing, as we have grown, which would be normal, um, more and more areas where there are disagreements. 
I will say that the overriding view and what has come out time and time again is the value of unity is the most important value that our ambassadors hold. And I think that we all strive to realize that, for instance, there may be different priorities depending on where our country is. Um, if it is North America, there are a set of priorities. If there if it is southern um, Italy or Poland or the Baltics, uh, they may have different priorities, but the security umbrella is our, our common goal, and I think our ambassadors and, and of course, our capitals uh, believe that that is overriding. But if we lose that, and uh, if we let bilateral disagreements or um, even disagreements with all of the other members of NATO divide us in the common uh, responsibility that we have, that's when we will unravel. I do want to say before, I know you will talk to my colleague, um, Ambassador Lucas, um, that we have two of our other NATO ambassadors here, and I was so pleased. Hans Dieter and I said, are you spying on us? Uh, but we have the ambassador from Greece and the ambassador from Denmark, and uh, so pleased that, that our colleagues are here, and uh, we all do have kind of a, uh, an extended family spirit um, in having gotten to know each other so well. So with that, thank you. Thank you, and I'll pass it to Jordan, but I would have to follow up, Ambassador, this is why I'm here. Um, you didn't say anything about the fact that this, most of the, at least before we got the brain dead comments, most of the criticism was coming from the United States and not always well-informed criticism about NATO. Well, let me say that uh, the one thing I would uh, suggest is that the president's comment of obsolete was 2016. President Macron's comment that it was brain dead was 2019. I believe the president of the United States now uh, does have a lot of confidence in NATO. Uh, he just last month or maybe two weeks ago uh, said he wants NATO to do more, more in Iraq and, and the Middle East. I think he has confidence. Um, his cabinet certainly does as well. And I think uh, <coughs> President Trump um, really took on President Macron. I think that was in the public uh, arena. And I think um, it, I think there was a real sense in London at the, um, the last leaders meeting that transatlantic bond is what describes NATO. And everyone in, in those meetings, and I was in those uh, internal meetings as was Ambassador uh, Lucas, um, transatlantic is our strength. And I, I will say one more thing uh, as a, my personal observation, because as many people know, I was in the United States Senate for 20 years, so I had that perspective. But uh, my perspective now that I have been in NATO and have been a strong supporter of NATO throughout my career, but this is the special nature of NATO that I didn't really realize was so important, and that is we bring very different perspectives on security. And both of those perspectives are what make us stronger in many ways. Um, America is aggressive in national defense and security issues. Europeans uh, generally uh, sometimes are, but are more inclined to um, discuss, hear all opinions, be um, uh, very careful in going forward. We need both. <laughs> uh, we need to be pushed. Um, we Americans don't need to be pushed. I think uh, sometimes my uh, colleagues think we are uh, cowboys in America. But, um, but we do push the alliance, and our other colleagues um, 
in varying degrees, we'll say, well, let's talk about this more. Let's make sure that we're on the right track. Let's make sure that we've heard all the views, which is very valid, and we do need to think through what we're doing. But what I think that's the value of uh, the importance of transatlantic bond. I don't think Europe could do what we're going to need to do in the future by itself. Nor do I think America could do what we need to do in the future by ourselves. Because our challenges are, they're big now, but they're going to be bigger in the future. Because of new weapons technology, because of the rise of China, and the more hardening of China. And then we've got Russia and, and terrorism as well. So we need all of the democracies and the freedom lovers of the world to be with us, our partners as well as our allies. So I think the transatlantic bond part is the strength of our national and international security. Thank you, Ambassador. She's always a good support. I'm so glad she's here. Um, Ambassador, as the target of, of some of this aggression that comes from the United States, are you more worried about that inside the alliance than Russia, China, terrorism, new missiles? But I think that um, I mean, the fact that so many sort of uh, voted in favor of uh, internal divisions is, uh, is quite remarkable. And it reminds me a bit of a uh, famous saying by a um, very important um, German strategist, Carlton Clausewitz, uh, once said, uh, unity is the center of gravity of any alliance. I think that is true. So in that respect, I mean, we all I mean, have an interest in sort of keeping, keeping the shop together and overcome internal uh, divisions. I think that um, <clears throat> it, uh, is, is right what, what, uh, what, what, uh, what Kay said, of course, I mean, there are sort of different um, priorities, um, uh, perceptions that is normal, I mean, uh, in an alliance of 29 and, and soon uh, 30 countries, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's quite normal that um, uh, that we need, I mean, to a common um, uh, result, and and that one, I think we we made good progress over the last uh, five years since the inclination point of uh, of 2014. So, I mean, despite, of course, that for instance, our southern allies look toward the challenges uh, emanating from the south, our eastern allies look more, I mean, towards Russia. But at the end of the day, out there always was a good sort of common result. And if you look, I mean, about the achievements, they are quite remarkable. And, really strengthened uh, our deterrence and defense capabilities, enhanced forward presence uh, in the Green Baltic states in Poland, the tailored forward presence in the southeast. Um, we uh, have expanded our activities uh, in the southern um, arc of crisis. Uh, we are looking now at cyber and hybrid threats. Um, uh, at the London, London meeting, we sort of uh, agreed on the space as a new military uh, operational domain. We are looking at China now. So in that respect, I think we still do a good job. But of course, it is not easy. I mean, to always, I mean, to get, um, to, uh, to bring all these countries together, uh, which has something to do with the fact that we are 29 democracies. Uh, but it has also something to do with the fact that uh, the, the, the challenges coming from the outside are becoming more and more uh, complex. You see a multiplicity of challenges. So in that respect, uh, it is, uh, we have much more work to do in NATO than, I mean, 10, 10 years ago. I mean, to keep the shop together, uh, at the same time, uh, find common uh, res uh, responses to, um, to, all these, uh, to all these challenges. I think what we really need to do is <clears throat> to work on, I mean, always to, uh, to come also to a common political strategic understanding of, of what our priorities are. Um, of course, we had uh, an autumn uh, discussion about this, also at the London meeting, and uh, that is why, uh, also following the German initiative, we have now agreed on a um, setting and an, an motion a reflection process uh, within the alliance, really the aim, I mean, to to look at how we can even improve our political unity, political cohesion coordination um, uh, on, on political questions, and that is what we're working right now with you, I mean, to, um, uh, to seeing a report by a, a senior level expert group um, at the um, next uh, NATO summit in, uh, in, in 2021. I would like to make one additional um, uh, point. Uh, uh, of course, I mean, the, the choice was rather limited about the top 
sort of um, uh, challenges to, uh, to NATO, I would like to add one other, and that is um, the increasing volatility um, uh, uh, of the international system and the breakdown of the multilateral liberal order. Uh, and that, in my view, is one of the key challenges also I mean, to, uh, to NATO, uh, to what we call the political West. And that is why NATO is so important as an institution. I mean, besides the military aspect, I think NATO stands for um, effective uh, multilateralism and security policy. And as an institution, I mean, these institutions uh, like NATO, I mean, provide for more predictability uh, and, and go against volatility. And that is why I think why NATO is so important. But it's so important also I mean, to keep this unity I mean, beyond, I would say, the Atlantic space as a simple you know, that we still believe in um, um, multilateralism. And who's responsible for the breakdown in the international relationship? I mean, that, I mean, this is a long uh, topic. I mean, these are, of course, um, uh, powers who have put into question, uh, I mean, the rules based international order. I mean, I mean we have seen this in, um, in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, with Russia uh, put into question uh, fundamentals of the European security architecture. Uh, we see it in many, many other areas. So in that respect, I think that is something which we need to, to follow very closely. And I think that NATO can really make a huge contribution to maintaining the multilateral world. And I wanted to ask the audience, did anyone else in here um, vote other as the biggest threat to NATO? Or did everybody fall in line with our... Okay, there's one other back there. Could you, could you tell me what, what you consider the biggest threat then, if it wasn't on the list? No, I was commenting that all of them are relevant but Iran also could be included among the options. Um, that's true, um, and that has been has come up at NATO on the sidelines. It's not a, a direct NATO issue, um, but of course it's, it's very pertinent right now, especially when we're, we're looking at the possibility that, that Iran returns to the Bayman enrichment. Is that something that you find comes up um, uh, in your discussions, concern about this? Well, in the wider Middle East debate? Please. Well, certainly uh, looking at the wider Middle East, um, the Iran-backed militias are uh, well beyond Iran itself, and very much uh, we have many NATO allies um, either together um, in the uh, Afghanistan uh, mission, which is a NATO mission, as well as the uh, mission in Iraq. Uh, we're facing uh, Iranian back militias. So, yes, Iran is most certainly on the list of, of, uh, of act, an actual country, but also with um, a wider reach uh, that is certainly asymmetric. Um, and I think we are beginning to deal with that now um, on the nuclear weapon issue. Uh, besides the terrorism that, that Iran is. Um, perpetrating around the world, uh, around the Middle East, um, the nuclear weapon is something that is very much a part of uh, the concerns of our allies in NATO. And, um, of course, America <coughs> has stated very clearly that Iran cannot have a nuclear weapon because we're seeing what, how destabilizing it can be uh, when a rogue nation has a nuclear capability, as we have seen in North Korea. So I think that um, Iran should be on a list of, of um, relevant uh, concerns of NATO, and this is where we are certainly working with uh, European allies uh, to bring everyone together uh, on being very firm with Iran not to continue uh, trying to prevent a nuclear weapon. Ambassador Lucas, would you share the view that the U.S. role on the Iran question is to bring everybody together? <laughs> well, I think that... <laughs> exactly, <laughs> putting it that way. Um, yeah. to, to, to prevent them from, from uh, getting a nuclear weapon, I can, I can fill, fill out that question. Is the way the U.S. is handling the Iran issue bringing everybody together and working to prevent a nuclear weapon? Well, I think that I mean, with regard to the assessment of Iran, I mean, there's a great deal of... Um, agreement between uh, the Europeans and the Americans and so far as we are concerned. Um, first of all, by Iran's um, regional behavior, uh, we are concerned by the Iranian ballistic missile program, and we agree on the, on the common goal that Iran must never um, uh, get a nuclear weapon. Uh, but I think, of course, it's obvious that we don't agree really on the, um, uh, on 
the way ahead as far as I mean, there's uh, common code regarding preventing for, uh, Iran from getting nuclear weapons is concerned. So in that respect, and uh, uh, I can say also in, in this room that uh, I was the general chief negotiator on the JCPOA, so I'm particularly attached, attached to the JCPOA. Uh, I mean, not because I spent four years of my life on this, on, on this agreement, but I, I really, I'm, I'm really convinced that this, uh, um, uh, of course, like every agreement, I mean, has its shortcomings, but it's still, I mean, the, the best way to to prevent Iran from from getting a nuclear weapon, and that is why I think we, uh, this room, so to, I mean, the three, but the European Union and many others still, I mean, do their very best in order to to save the JCPOA, and that is where we have the disagreement with the U.S. with with uh, pursuing the maximum pressure campaign, which is not, um, I mean, our preferred way to, uh, to 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 get to this common goal. I have to really struggle not to go on on Iran because I want to bring everyone else in. Please be uh, tweeting about this debate at hashtag NATO8. And you can see on, on our slido.com slate here the questions that are coming in from this room and from elsewhere. Um, I will take a question from uh, our live audience and then I will probably bring up Turkey because it's something that both of our guests here uh, uh, will have a lot to say about. Okay, Brooks, you're Permanent, permanent position at the top of the list. Um, Brooks Tigner, James Defense Weekly. Do I need a microphone or not? Nothing about that. Um, no, because we can hear you. And I okay, hear you. fine. Um, just two quick questions. Um, Trump is putting pressure on the Allies to do more in the Middle East. I don't want to get into the politics of it. I don't think you'll address that. Let me just ask a pure geographic question. Do you see any place or anything that NATO could do beyond a slightly expanded uh, training role in Iraq in the Middle East? Yes or no, okay? And secondly, <laughs> Turkey, if we can believe reports that Turkey is transporting fighters to, um, from Syria to Libya, is this a good or a bad thing? Yes, so, no. Brooks's question is pretty, pretty much uh, uh, cover the Mediterranean threats that, uh, that NATO faces. So the questions are, what does President Trump mean? What can NATO do with the call to do more in the Middle Beyond East? Beyond the, the Iraq training mission. Beyond the Iraq training mission, which exists now, and I believe, if it's not back up and running, will be any day now. Um, and also, um, is it true, do we, do we have any intelligence that you can share about whether Turkey is transporting fighters to the And Canada? good or bad. Good, good or bad. I want them to answer that. OK, whether it's good or bad, that what? What does NATO Turkey. think about that? Is it good Turkey. or bad that Turkey, an ally, is doing that in Libya? Oh, it's, it's own fighters. Tur okay, okay, I, I understand. The Turkey no, is there are reports it's bringing Syrian fighters over to Libya. I don't know if it's true or not, but okay. if they have anything to tell us about that. If there's anything we can say that. about Turkey's role in um, further militarizing Libya, how would that cover it? Correct. Okay, that's for our audience who may not have heard it um, out there. That's a good one, a good five. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 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 okay. Well, I'm not going to interpret what, what, what President Trump meant with, uh, with NATO Middle East, but I can, can say that I mean, NATO is, of course, already active in the Middle East. You mentioned uh, the, uh, the mission in Iraq, uh, so there's no discussion on that. Could we be doing more uh, in Iraq? Uh, there is Afghanistan, of course, I and mean, it's not uh, strictly speaking, it's not Middle East, but it's Central Asia, of course. But beyond that, of course, NATO is already active uh, in the context of the um, Mediterranean dialogue. Um, with a number of Mediterranean countries, including uh, Israel, that is one of the very few formats where uh, sort of uh, countries such as uh, Israel, Jordan, uh, Egypt, uh, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Mauritania, at um, one table together with NATO. That is the the partnership with the um, uh, Gulf Cooperation countries in the context of the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative. So there are a number of um, of uh, a sort of partnership activities going on that is um, uh, we have stepped up our defense capacity uh, building uh, efforts and particularly with regard to Jordan and Tunisia and I think if we um, speak about a uh, NATO's role in, in the Middle East I think what, what we always could do is mean to do more with regard to partnerships I mean that depends a bit of course on on, on the interests of um, of partners, but I think uh, doing more in these areas, I mean, is, is always something which we can, which we can, uh, uh, which we can consider. And I think we should do this also in close cooperation with the European Union, uh, because uh, I mean, the Middle East is an area where the European Union is uh, hugely active uh, uh, in the field of uh, uh, development, for instance, but also financial assistance. 
um, CSDP emissions and so on and so forth. So that is, I think, that's also a good field, I mean, for monitoring new corporations. And on the fighters, and I have no intelligence on that one, but I can only say you know, we had, a couple of days ago we had the Berlin conference on Libya um, with a very substantial um, final communique. And the very essence of that is that sort of um, uh, uh, a commitment from everybody uh, to refrain from external interference. Uh, and that is what we have now to look at and to work on, in particular also with regards to respecting the arms embargo. And that is, um, uh, uh, that otherwise it will be very difficult to, to, uh, to maintain a ceasefire. And that is one of the reasons why we think that the results uh, of, of the Libya um, uh, conference should also be endorsed in the Security Council resolution, so it's binding for everybody. I would just agree totally uh, with Hans Dieter on the issue of uh, any outside influence in Libya. Um, I think all of us are in agreement there should be none. And I think everyone on the outside has agreed to that at this point. Um, and it's a, a fragile, um, I think, agreement and one that we need to continue to watch. But I think we're all in agreement that there should not be any. Uh, outside uh, military movement uh, in Libya. On the issue of can we do more in Iraq and in the Middle East, um, yes, NATO can. And I believe that we will uh, certainly start looking at it in phases. Uh, but <coughs> number one, um, the de-ISIS coalition is still the most important priority for NATO and for uh, the U.S. and our allies. Uh, we cannot allow the disagreements, the um, instability in Iraq to affect the de-ISIS coalition. Because if ISIS starts rising again, none of us are safe. So that's the most important thing. Uh, it is not NATO that is in, NATO is in the de-ISIS coalition, but it is a coalition that includes many partners. Um, it's in the neighborhood of 40 partners that are committed to fighting ISIS wherever it is, which means uh, Syria as well as um, Iraq and, um, and in Afghanistan. So we are united in the coalition, and NATO is a part of the coalition, uh, that will continue to stand uh, so that ISIS cannot uh, resurge again. Um, I think one way that NATO itself as its <coughs> mission, which we call NMI, NATO Mission Iraq, um, is to do more of the training of Iraqi troops uh, to fulfill uh, more capabilities that would allow the, the ISIS coalition, which is, uh, is working separately in Iraq, but in close uh, contact, of course, um, I think we can do more on taking some of the uh, burdens off of the de-ISIS coalition for training and advising more Iraqi troops to come on board uh, to be able to uh, protect their own country. And that would be the first phases of what we would, we would uh, try to have coming into the uh, NMI, the Iraqi NATO mission. Ambassador, the uh, killing of uh, Qasem Soleimani forced both the coalition and NATO to suspend their training missions in Iraq. Was that helpful? Well, I think uh, because of the, um, the disagreements that are within Iraq, um, the government is now trying to let things uh, settle down. And um, I think all of us want the de-ISIS coalition to come back into um, its uh, place of strength uh, to keep ISIS from uh, forming again. And part of that is um, for the government to, to be able to start working together to assure the security of the Iraqi people as well as the troops that are there fighting the terrorism there. So uh, I think, yes, it was the right thing to do for force protection to uh, pause the, the uh, efforts, but 
Um, I think we are in a very good place to uh, begin to go back into uh, both uh, assuring that ISIS doesn't rise at the same time uh, that the the government of Iraq, which is which has uh, different factions represented in this parliament, um, is certainly in a lot of conversation about uh, the NATO forces coming in, which is a, has a very positive uh, view, and we believe we will be uh, reaffirmed as uh, uh, the Iraqi people wanting NATO to be a force there. Uh, because we are working with the Iraqi people themselves to uh, get, make them stronger in protecting themselves. So I think uh, it was right to pause, but I think we all know that going forward there will be strong activity in NATO and that the Diocese Coalition will also continue um, with the support of the Iraqi people. Uh, can I just ask a quick uh, factual follow-up? Um, has the threat of Iraq asking the U.S. to leave then uh, has that been assuaged by now? Well, I yeah. think has it certainly uh, the, well, the, the parliamentary vote, which is certainly a valid vote, but uh, I'm, almost half of the parliament did not come in for the vote. So it's not as if this was a uh, unanimous view in Iraq. It was... Um, certainly a, an important view, and it was the majority by, I think, a few votes, but that was because several of the factions just boycotted the vote. Uh, and I think we are in constant discussion now with the Prime Minister. The, the government itself um, is um, a caretaker government, so we are working with the Prime Minister, who is still the Prime Minister, but the the president has uh, resigned, and so I think we are trying to visit with all of the factions. Uh, we, NATO, are, uh, are trying to make sure that we're covering all the bases to assure that it is the will of the Iraqi people that we stay in, and that in a caretaker government, uh, it, it's important to be talking to all of the people, including the prime minister who is there, um, but but without the president. So, yes, I think we're working, and I think there, that we're in a good place, and I think the uh, conversations have been positive, um, and I think as long as we just take it one step at a time, um, and the, the different groups are positive about NATO coming in, that um, that, that is the way it works. <coughs> Now we just know that Germany has resumed its training mission in Iraq now, as of the last couple of days, as I understand it, and Germany does not take part in the NATO training mission in Iraq. So, Fernanda, we are part of a coalition, um, the ISIS coalition, and they're doing essentially sort of uh, training uh, in, in Erbil, and we have also, uh, and, and uh, this is active again, and uh, I think that is... Uh, not the case of part of our contingent, which is working in central Iraq. Uh, so in that respect, I mean, we are waiting for the um, clearance by the um, um, uh, uh, command of, 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 of the coalition that um, activities in central Iraq can be resumed again. Okay, I'm going to take one of our online questions. Um, although fact-checking it at the time, should Turkey still be a member of the alliance given its recent problematic behavior? Um, there is no mechanism for kicking Turkey out, for kicking any member of NATO out, even if that were the view of the alliance. Um, that isn't a possibility. So perhaps we could just expand on um, the, the relationship um, of Turkey with some of its NATO allies uh, individually and um, some of the, the NATO behavior, some of the Turkish behavior which is, has troubled NATO. For example, the S-400 purchase, the purchase of a missile system which is not compatible with NATO's missile defense. Would you like to start with that? Well, uh, the answer is that yes, NATO uh, should still have Turkey uh, as an ally, um, even though there are definite problems, and most certainly um, we believe that having a Russian missile defense system within our alliance is a problem. 
um, and that is very public. Um, and I, I think we have done uh, a lot of work to try to reverse that decision. Um, and and I think what we're trying to make sure we do is try to keep Turkey in the alliance. I think um, it's hard because they are doing um, uh, several things that are uh, problematic in the alliance, um, including, as many of you know, um, uh, trying to keep um, Israel and, and some of their activities uh, out of uh, the operations in, um, in the NATO alliance. But we are all very welcoming of Israel, of course. Um, and so we have many areas of concern uh, about Turkey, but we want Turkey to stay in the alliance <coughs> working with Turkey because if they are not in the alliance, we, we uh, would be concerned about getting more and more aligned with Russia, and that is not in any of our interests. Um, so we are very hopeful that we will, by continuing to keep them in the alliance, to work with them in every way that we can, to encourage them to, um, to strengthen their position in the alliance, that, that is our best course, uh, rather than uh, doing something that isolates them further and uh, leaves that very important uh, place they are in geography um, as well as um, they are a democracy, and we want them to um, to reform uh, areas that have been, um, I think, um, lessened. And by being in the alliance, we will have more influence with them than if they are not. Well, I, I of course, I agree with that. Of course, Turkey is a, a hugely important. Uh, ally, um, I mean, only look at uh, the Turkey's uh, geostrategic uh, position. Of course, it's scarce. I mean, there are obvious disagreements. Um, yes, for Hungary, there is uh, one element here. The other one was uh, uh, Turkey's military um, intervention in northern Syria. I mean, there is, of course, uh, that's more for the EU side. I mean, the question of of um, uh, border agreement with Libya, drilling, and so on and so forth. So, the ideas, of course, are. Um, difficult uh, topics, and, and I think that in NATO we don't conceal these um, these differences, and I think we have a, quite an open um, uh, and frank discussion with, with our Turkish uh, allies on, on these uh, questions. But at the same time, part of the picture is also that Turkey is um, is hugely sort of affected yeah, by, by its geostrategic situation, so Turkey is hosting more than 3.5 million refugees, I and mean, we must not forget this. Also, when we discussed in the European Union, the whole question of uh, uncontrolled migration. And Turkey is also affected by, um, by uh, terrorist attacks, I think, like, like no other uh, uh, NATO ally. So that's, we need uh, to look at Turkey in, in the context of a differentiated picture, uh, not conceding our, our differences. Uh, but I totally agree with, with, uh, with Kay that, of course, it is in, in all our strategic interests to be that, that the Turkey remains uh, within the alliance. On the other side, I think it's also in Turkey's uh, strategic interest, I mean, to, uh, I mean to, 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 to remain an ally and to, to continue to work in the alliance because, um, I mean, given the predictor, it's a very difficult um, um, geostrategic environment. I think uh, also for uh, Turkey, NATO is really an anchor. <coughs> Uh, of stability and, 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 and the lifeline, so to speak, to the, to the, um, with the political West. And, and final point, of course, I mean, if you look at all the issues uh, which cause so many problems in our neighborhood, um, uh, I think Turkey is a very important element. And, I mean, they participate in uh, very substantially NATO missions in Afghanistan, Kosovo, uh, uh, Iraq, uh, the Aegean activity uh, NATO has uh, with regards to to fighting uh, illegal migration in, uh, in the Aegean. Uh, and also, if you look at the, the various formats uh, aimed at uh, coming to a solution with regard to the Syrian question, Libya, uh, the Libya conference uh, in Berlin, um, uh, Turkey played a very important role. So, in that respect, I think, uh, of course, we need to, to, to continue to work with Turkey and to Turkey also as, a, as, a, as an important ally. Thank you.
I'd like to take another question from the room, and I would really like a young lady. Hello? Okay, am I going to have to call? Yeah, I can't tell who they are down there. I know someone in there who always has a question. Hmm. <laughs> Or the other no, I, maybe she just came for lunch. <laughs> okay, I am I am stunned as a member of women in international security and everything else that nobody, no, no young ladies in this room are standing up to ask a question. So, oh, another a young lady here in the front row. Not that young, but thank you. <laughs> uh, if you can introduce yourself. To sorry, Catherine Pure, EU reporter. Um, I'm here more of interested to inform myself, I have said. But you know, given your discussions, you know, you, when you talk about you know, ISIS and the, you know, the fighting terrorism within Northern Ireland, I know quite difficult to fight terrorism. Um, and it's also <laughs> very important to fight the causes of terrorism. And I think the United States and uh, the EU have both played a huge role in providing the environment and the conditions where peace um, could come about. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking my narrow parochial <laughs> concerns, but you know, how would you apply that in the wider environment? And I have to say that I'm a bit concerned when I see the Middle East plan, peace plan where there doesn't seem to be any consideration of the other side of the argument. There doesn't seem to be enough involvement of the EU. And I think the US and the EU, EU when they're working together, can be a, a tremendous force for good and to fight not just terrorism, but the causes of terrorism. So um, maybe you could say something about that. So that's a, a lot of questions. The Middle East Peace Plan, the one oh, no, no, the Middle East a general from the front row. Okay. okay, and there was a question on here on our online um, slate about Israel becoming a member of NATO. If we could least talk, Israel does have a role, a relationship with NATO, and there are many partnerships in the Middle East um, that often don't get don't get press because I don't write about it and a lot of us don't write about it, but there are partnerships in Jordan and, and uh, in the uh, center in Kuwait. So maybe we could branch that out a bit as education for all of us. Well, we do have many partners, uh, member uh, allies of Europe or North America, but we have many valuable partners that take, uh, that take major roles in uh, 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 missions. And, um, of course, Israel is a welcome uh, partner in the uh, Mediterranean Dialogue, um, ICI, and uh, so there's a lot of back and forth. We have a great ambassador uh, from Israel that we um, work with in many instances. So, um, and we have uh, Jordan is also a partner as well as um, several uh, other Middle East partners uh, that we work with, UAE, Qatar, um, in many ranges. So we, if any uh, country that is wanting to work with us, we pretty much do. Uh, and so, of course, Israel is one of those. Yeah, maybe the question about uh, sort of NATO and Ireland with a view to the uh, Middle East. I think on that one, and of course, the basis here is the Washington and the Russian Treaty says that uh, NATO is in principle open to any European state. So that is what the, the, what the Washington Treaty is saying about uh, I mean, what, what options we have for, for rights to, uh, to enlargement. Now on the, on, the, on the wider question, of course, that is something you know, which is not so much a question which um, we discuss at NATO. You know, at, at the end of the day, I think this is a, a broad alliance, but uh, if we look at our tools, there are I mean, essentially two tools. This is um, um, a military tool in the wider sense, including, of course, defense capacity building, and that's, of course, political dialogue, uh, which is also very important, which must not be underestimated in, with, in, in our dealings with our various partners, including also in the Middle East. So in that respect, of course, we can address, I mean, also the root causes of terrorism, but if you look at the root causes of terrorism, which has a lot to do with, I mean, the social and economic um, uh, conditions, uh, which relates also to the whole question of the radicalization, and so on and so forth. So I mean, these are sort of questions which I think needs to be um, uh, tackled uh, with a, in the context of a broader, uh, comprehensive approach. And I think that in that respect, I think the European Union is in much better place. 
uh, to address the, the root causes of, um, uh, of terrorism. And I totally agree with you. And that is something where we in the European Union and the US should work closely together. Um, because I, I, I tend to say that uh, at the end of the day, if you look at you know, what we call the political West, I mean, there are three sort of essential pillars. That's the US, the European Union, and, and NATO, with, of course, uh, a lot of overlap there. But um, I, I think with regard to the whole question, stabilizing the, you know, the greater Middle East uh, in all its dimensions, I think that is a huge task uh, for, for, for the US and, and the European Union. And at least that is why we also need to get together with regard to, to, uh, with regard to our competitive concept as far as the future of this region is concerned. I'm going to go to another question that came on our slate here. And um, this is a very sensitive question, not just um, because I do work for a news organization um, that was involved here, and Ambassador Hutchison, this comes down on you, um, or to you, I should say. Um, when the Secretary of State says to a journalist, in this case, Mary Louise Kelly of NPR, um, who was, there were some repercussions in, uh, from this interview, that, that Americans don't care about Ukraine, yet NATO allies, NATO as an organization, and the EU are very much focused on helping strengthen Ukraine. Does this not make that effort much more difficult and embolden President Putin to play around the edges of Ukraine? Well, I think uh, the Secretary of State and everyone else, the President of the United States, uh, Congress uh, in the United States, are very supportive of Ukraine. And we are uh, giving them billions of uh, dollars in equipment and arms and uh, humanitarian aid. Uh, the EU is also uh, doing humanitarian aid. And we want the people of Ukraine to have the freedom and the human rights and the uh, rule of law that will create an economy uh, for that country. And that is a unanimous uh, view of America and all of our administration as well as our country. Ambassador Lucas, have you been troubled by the things we've been hearing about U.S. policy on Ukraine? Well, I think as far as, I mean, we, we are, uh, what we're doing together in NATO, we are totally lined up. Um, so uh, I think we, I mean, for us, uh, there's no doubt about it. I mean, for NATO, Ukraine is a, is a hugely important partner with whom we work together in the framework of the, the state uh, partnership. So we have an extremely close uh, political dialogue with the Ukraine uh, in the context of the so-called NATO Ukraine Commission, we had a visit um, by the um, North Atlantic Council and the Secretary General to Odessa and Kiev a couple of months ago. We had a very good productive meeting with, uh, with President Zelensky and, and members of the um, of the uh, uh, of the Rada. Uh, we are very active with regards and sort of to um, uh, uh, to doing more as an alliance also in the Black Sea region. Uh, supporting the Ukrainian um, uh, uh, Navy, um, uh, again, defense capacity building, um, and of course, an unwavering support for Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty, um, uh, which we tried I mean, to, uh, to move forward also in the context of the Normandy flow. So I think, you know, as far as, 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 uh, as NATO is concerned, I mean, we are really singing from one page. That's true, but we're hearing things that are quite troubling about how some of those decisions are made, whether that's in the short term, um, and, and however the conclusions come out in the end. The headlines can't escape you. Well, I mean, the headlines are the headlines, and uh, on the other hand, I mean, I'm, I as NATO ambassador, I mean, for me, what is really counts is what we as, 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 a, as, a, as an organization achieve. And I can only tell you, we just had a NATO Ukraine Council with the uh, high ranking Ukrainian uh, politician deputy. Prime Minister for, for European Atlantic Integration. And I think there's a, a lot of appreciation also from the Ukrainian side for what NATO uh, and all NATO allies are doing for Ukraine. Okay. There was a question way in the back here. Yes, sir. Can please tell us who you are? And let's keep questions short so that we can get to as many as possible in our remaining uh, 15 or so minutes. Remember, Thank hashtag you. NATO8 on Twitter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, citizens. My name is Andros Karlaftis, EPACOS Advisors. We represent the ECOWAX movement, the pan European Mediterranean movement, which has uh, its pillars in direct democracy, in science, and in ecology. We have a very strong uh, uh, thesis, stance about NATO future, our allies, which we believe that the circle has, has ended. The, the circle of the transatlantic 
cooperation has ended. Already we are speaking for Mediterranean cooperation. So we believe that NATO should change its scopes and purposes and uh, make a broader approach with the assistance of the United Nations and uh, uh, at the same time should move its basement from Brussels to Turkey. Because Turkey is aggressive because it, it has internal problems and this uh, will not end. Okay, is that, is that it's an old question, story. whether you think NATO will move? Yes, should move over there. At the same time, we have to build some proposal from 2008, the European Defense Community, according to the Treaty of 1952. There are uh, a lot of people and citizens which are, are supporting our approach. Thank you very much. <coughs> I'm not sure that was really a question. Um, okay, um, yes, ma'am. There you are. Yeah. Look at what I accused of just coming to eat. No, 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 I came for the conference, don't okay. worry. Thank you. Um, I have kind of also <laughs> more on... you are. Uh, hi, my name is Leah. I'm a student from Strasbourg, Paris. Um, I'm actually waiting security clearance for NATO, so hopefully I'll get in. Um, I have a bit more question on the future of NATO. Now, I follow a little bit more on the space strategy. I find that really exciting. But I see a lot of work happening in the European Union, in European member states, on space. And then also, you know, we have the new SCAF for FCAS, fight, next generation fighter. So we see European defense really trying to collaboratively evolve. And I want to know your opinion on space as the next frontier and even defense cooperation. How feasible is it? What would it look like? And not really going to European Army because that's not necessarily feasible right now. I am purposely skipping the European Army debate because we've had it in so many fora. <laughs> So, um, yes, future of space, just the name, the fifth, uh, the fifth domain, potential domain of warfare. Yes, I'm very excited um, about the space as a domain um, <coughs> that we have adopted in NATO. The United States uh, has now set up a space command um, that is within the Air Force. So, uh, I think we have to be realistic, and I think this is one of the pluses of NATO, is our adapting to new uh, <coughs> types of warfare, new types of defense uh, weaponry, and declaring space a domain shows NATO's adaptability to me. Um, because think of artificial intelligence and what could happen in space if we don't have the knowledge to keep up with and defend against uh, any kind of potential um, hybrid or cyber attack that could come from, from space. So I think that um, it is a, a real plus that we have been able to so relatively quickly uh, adopt space as a domain. And I think uh, when you look at the capabilities for cyber and hybrid attacks, and then you look at the capabilities of artificial intelligence that could uh, redirect uh, any kind of an order that uh, might come from a satellite or from a space uh, uh, capability, we've got to be more on top of it than the potential adversary that we might face. And to be able to defend and deter uh, is going to be more and more important in that space domain and the use of, of that space domain. Yeah, it's nothing to add with regard to space. I also find it important. I think it's an impressive uh, uh, example of, of NATO's uh, capability to adapt. And I still think, and, <clears throat> and we look at the fact that this is an al alliance of so many nations, democracies, and that we are ready I mean, to, to do so many things. I have been ready to do so many things in the couple or in, in the last five years. So I think it's really amazing. Yeah? And, uh, and, and there, there's, of course, more to come. but. Again, I mean, this alliance will only survive if it lives up I mean, to its key commitment and obligation that is to protect our nations. And for that reason, we need to be able to adapt. And um, I think on that one, I mean, our record is, is, is pretty good. I mean, there's, of course, always lot, some criticism with regards to NATO, and there are these the divergencies, but I, I tend to, uh, to agree with, um, uh, with, with Mark Twain when what he said about uh, the famous quote about uh, what is music, you know, it probably it's actually better than it sounds. Um, so in that respect, I think uh, the, the, the overall record is, is quite good. Now, there was a second uh, question on the European capabilities. And I think uh, it is a good thing that, that Europeans are now working on strengthening their uh, defense industrial base. I think it's a good thing. 
But if you want to be taken seriously, of course, you have to, to develop your own capabilities. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't see a contradiction here with, uh, with regard to I mean, maintaining the, the transatlantic alliance. I think Europeans need to develop capabilities, uh, but sort of in the, but well coordinated with NATO. And that is why we have the NATO defense planning process, and we have now the European Union card, and that needs to be coordinated. So that at the end of the day, we get to a set of European capabilities, which are available, of course, to NATO, but also to the European Union. And, uh, and that is what I understand by strengthening European power. I think that is maybe a, a, a better notion to express uh, what, what we are trying to achieve in, the, in Europe than, than the European Army. It's about European capabilities, about being meaningful and being serious when it comes to, to defense. Capabilities available to NATO, capabilities also available to the European Union. And, and both, I mean, is what, what, what we mean when we talk about uh, strengthening the European uh, pillar. But that, of course, needs to be accompanied also by the political will to use the capabilities. Let me just uh, jump in and say that um, I think the way you have stated it is the right way. The concern that you hear so many Americans uh, put forward is in the setup of PESCO and the European Defense Fund, uh, there is such a, um, a bar against outside companies being part of a, a project. And one of the great things that has been developed over the years is that there are European and American collaborations on major um, uh, your major defense equipment, I will say, like uh, airplanes, like F-35s. There are many European parts in an F-35. Uh, those are projects that should be able to be done together. But going forward, there is concern on the American side that because of the restrictions on PESCO and therefore the EDF follow-on uh, procurement, that we're not going to have the collaboration and therefore, A, you won't get the strongest input into major projects that we're both going to use in our NATO interoperability, <coughs> and B, that we won't have the capability for Europeans to be part of American uh, projects or vice versa. And that is our concern. It's not that we don't think it's great that Europe is going together to do the research and development for uh, an industrial base. We understand that perfectly. But to box out collaboration with outside partners, uh, outside the EU that is, um, that's where I think we would like to see some accommodation in the regulations. And this is still up in the air, we should point out. And Ambassador Lucas, um, what EU countries buy from the United States absolutely dwarfs what, what the US buys from the European Union, buys something like, I wish I had the number on top of my head, but something like 80%. Um, and um, so is this US criticism unfair? Are these US fears unfair that they <coughs> might lose some sales and therefore some um, uh, cooperation and some interoperability due to EDF and EDA? Well, I, I, I think we don't see it as, as dramatic as uh, that. Uh, and, and you're right, you say, Terry, that with regard to PESCO, we have not yet, uh, we have not yet come to a final decision on that one. So there's an ongoing process that was delayed because of Brexit. And um, I can only speak for my government. We are uh, in favor of a very flexible third party participation with the Commission. So for everyone else, that, that means that it hasn't been decided yet whether the, the U.S. and other third countries will be allowed to participate in some of the No, no, it's, it's not a question of principle, but it's a question how? of how. How? How? Right. I mean, the if is not being put into question. Right. Okay. Um, now, I really do have to take this question because it's huge. China, not only was that one of the concerns on our initial poll, but um, there have been new developments just in the last day with the European Union deciding that... Um, uh, its countries may use Huawei technology and 5G expansion if they implement uh, certain safeguards. The U.S. is, is not comfortable with this. In fact, uh, U.S. Defense Secretary Shanahan in his brief 
uh, tenure. Um, went so far as to say on Capitol Hill that the U.S. would cut off intelligence sharing with NATO allies if they if they used Huawei and 5G technology. That's already happening. So how do you see this? The, the response from the administration has been swift in disappointment with this decision yesterday. Ambassador, how will that play out when you're talking about NATO's having to share information? Well, I think that it, it is an issue uh, that we are very concerned about. Uh, the capability for Huawei and any part of the communications network um, that would then uh, come into the defense and security uh, arena. Uh, we were disappointed, of course, in the UK and have asked UK to uh, reconsider. Uh, and there are other countries that have have some Huawei. Uh, UK says theirs is only in the commercial sector, but then uh, the, the question is if there is a communication between the commercial sector and the uh, security sector, then are you, uh, it, is the poison then uh, in the system? So I think we have a lot of work to do if um, if we are going to keep our systems um, secure uh, from interference. Um, we certainly have asked EU, which has a real regulatory capability, uh, to make regulations that would, um, in their requirements for procurement of our um, uh, uh, defense uh, equipment, have uh, specifications that would be um, uh, not allowing a bid by a <coughs> company that can't protect its privacy and, uh, and its own security. Uh, so I think that is something that is to be worked out. We're concerned about it. But, but China itself is um, an area that all of us need to be very, very cognizant um, is not only rising economically, and we are all trying to um, work with China and the World Trade Organization and, and in trade and tariff um, relationships to bring them into the um, rules-based order so that we are competing on a level playing field. China was a third world country, we let them get by with not being exactly uh, fair because they subsidized, they stole intellectual property. Uh, but now that they are a major competitor, we are asking for a level playing field. This is EU as well as the US and others uh, in concert. And I think that uh, in the area of the buildup, we are seeing China then become also more active militarily. And I think we have to recognize all of this and look at what they are doing and try to bring them in to the rules-based order. We want China, and we think it would be in China's interest as well as our own, to have a robust trade relationship. Um, but a robust trade relationship cannot be grounded in a, an unlevel playing field. So I think we have to look at economics, we have to look at militarization, militarization not only the buildup of their armies, but militarization of uh, islands in the South China Sea, islands that have been built to acquire more navigation um, um, space, and um, the uh, purchase or, or um, uh, building um, infrastructure in our ports. Uh, China controls 70% of the container ports in the world, uh, the biggest ones. So I think we've got to be very, very cognizant of China's rise, work with them to bring them into the rules-based order, make them a level playing field um, competitor with whom we can have a good relationship. We, we the Western democracies that are in the rules-based order, um, so that we can build both of our economies. At the same time, Ambassador, um, 
this is one of the areas where the Europeans would say perhaps President Trump's strategies haven't been so destructive on working together with the EU to, con to counter some of these joint concerns about China. So I will let you come back if you would like, but Ambassador Lucas, um, yeah. do you feel that, um, that the U.S. has, has helped build a, a joint Western, um, not defense, but um, resilience toward the rise of China and specifically on 5G? Are you sure with this new allowance granted by the EU yesterday that, that Germany can protect its network against a potential interference by the Chinese government? Well, I understand. I mean, the box EU presented yesterday is a toolbox. Yeah. Uh, so there's a toolbox from which you can sort of choose. I mean, we have now the, the British decision on on 5G. I mean, in Germany we still have a very sort of lively debate, uh, uh, which is not finalized yet. But I think at this, if you look at the new toolbox, the British decision, also the mainstream of the German debate goes very much into the direction not excluding a company as such, um, because where it comes from, but look at very specific sort of security requirements and, and security standards, uh, uh, which then should provide for a safe um, and secure um, uh, uh, IT uh, architecture, and that is what we are looking right now to define these, these requirements. Uh, and that is by the same, I mean, the, the same principle has been followed now, I think, by, by, by the Brits, but uh, as I said, I mean, the, the, the discussion in Germany is still, is still uh, going on. But it seems to me that this is a bit more the, the mainstream here in, um, uh, uh, in, in Europe. But I think that we should, of course, I mean, uh, this is a very important topic. But at the same time, I think we must not reduce the question of China, I mean, to, uh, to 5G. But it goes beyond that, um, and that is what we have been doing now in, the, in, in NATO over the last year. Um, and we try to look at the various areas where China is playing a role um, as, a, as an actor relevant for security policy in the Euro-Atlantic security um, area. Uh, and that is, of course, critical infrastructure, Kay mentioned ports, uh, but uh, China is, um, uh, is also a very important player I mean, in Afghanistan, where we have our most important military operation. And China is, um, is developing um, uh, uh, very modern uh, weapon systems, uh, hypersonic, for instance. Uh, China is playing a role with the whole discussion on, uh, with regard to the whole discussion on the end of the INF Treaty, uh, with regard to the question of the extension of the New START Treaty, so the whole global um, um, uh, arms control uh, architecture. Um, and there, there are many, many areas. So, I mean, there's good reason, I mean, to look, uh, to look and, and to analyze uh, China's role, uh, and we are still doing that, um, so there are no final conclusions. But I think one, I mean, if you look at integrated infrastructure, of course, one uh, area is uh, strengthening resilience. At the same time, I think there is also at NATO a strong consensus that, of course, we do not see uh, China as an enemy or an adversary, but um, as, as, a, as an increasingly important player, um, uh, uh, of which we need to, to analyze, the first time, to, need to, to whom we need to adapt, but also with whom we need to engage. So there is some sort of engagement uh, also already between NATO and, and China. But I think what we also need now is to better with China is something to, uh, to have uh, a dialogue with China, but at the same time, of course, talk to our partners in Asia Pacific. So we have now a very sort of uh, strong relationship, on, uh, have a stronger relationship, I'd say, with, uh, with very uh, important uh, partners in Asia Pacific, with Japan, Korea, and New Zealand and Australia, for whom China is also very important. So, I mean, these are a couple of of areas very active right now, but we have just started it. I mean, it's one of the many areas uh, NATO is now for, I mean, new areas NATO is now focusing in, but I think China is really a very important, a very important um, uh, um, uh, factor here. And uh, I, I mean, your last sentence on your initial test question, I think that uh, the importance of China in the global system is, is I think, is a good question there also for the transatlantic relationship in future. Unfortunately, it's one of the ones where there isn't a lot of dissonance at the moment, right? Be like, no, you don't have to start because we're out of time. I, I was about to answer that, and that's a whoop. I'll catch you later on that one. No, there isn't. I mean, it's something where we haven't seen a, a lot of disagreement. Um, we are out of time. I know the ambassador has to rush off, but um, this has been a real privilege.
two of my favorite amb ambassadors, and uh, to all of you um, who came here to join us, thank you very much. What a great initiative. I think I really enjoyed this debate. Did you like getting the questions from the audience? Absolutely. It was really fun. You did a great job of thank you. synthesizing it. It was great. I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much to, uh, to our organizers, to our hosts, and uh, to all of you for coming. And um, we need to continue this debate as much as possible. Um, I think one of the biggest threats to transatlantic cooperation is the lack of knowledge. And the discussion, and I always try to foster that as to both of you. So, thank you to everyone.